This meeting is being recorded. And we can and get things kicked off. All right. Great. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Robbins. I am the Dean of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I am very pleased to represent Science Hall today, which includes both environmental studies and the Department of Geography, the State Cartographer's Office, um, and the Cart Lab, uh, and the Cartography Lab Library. We're like a big, happy Science Hall family. Sadly, of course, none of us are in Science Hall. Uh, having said that, we're here to host the second in our series, Our Shared Future, uh, which celebrates in part the Our Shared Future Heritage Marker, which is housed in Science Hall right now, technically between the 9th and the 13th, but I bet it's still there. Um, this acknowledges tribal sovereignty and university relations with Native nations. This heritage marker is something that inspired this series, Our Shared Future, where we hear from cultural officers from the sovereign Native nations around the state. The event uh, that you're tuned into, and I'd like to welcome, we've got like 50 people out there, thank you for coming, is hosted by the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and the Department of Geography. And it's sponsored by a UW-Madison Provost Educational Innovation Initiative Grant. What that means is it's a grant that goes out for education in general, but a lot of it's targeted to precisely a better and richer understanding of the cultural experience and history of our tribal partners around the state. Um, the event is also supported by a capstone in environmental studies, uh, ES 600, um, which is conservation with uh, Native nations in Wisconsin. Um, and it's also um, supported by the Native Nations UW initiative led by Jesse Conaway, who's going to kick things off here in a minute. Um, Jesse is our faculty associate for Native Nations partnerships at the Nelson Institute, and she's co-chair of the Native Nations UW working group, and she spent with her colleagues and with our partners around the state a year developing a strategic, strategic plan that we've been rolling out um, to better serve and work with our tribal partners in the state. Um, and one of those big priorities was increased cultural education on the part of UW staff and faculty and students and uh, more sharing uh, about and with our partners and neighbors, the sovereign Native nations of the state that we now call uh, Wisconsin. So Jesse's gonna handle it from here. Thank you all for coming. We're really pleased. And thank you, Edith Lioso, for, for joining us uh, in this very crazy, busy time. Jesse. Hi, greetings, everyone. Uh, Jesse here. Uh, Dr. Robbins took all my talking points. So, um, Oh, this will be really quick. Uh, it, welcome to each of you, um, and especially to Edith Lioso, who my students will be introducing shortly. Um, I wanted to end acknowledgement for UW-Madison, uh, which we're operating virtually. Please join me in acknowledging that UW-Madison campus rests on the ancestral territory of the Ho-Chunk Nation people of the big voice who have called what we now call Madison de Jope for time immemorial and have evidence uh, of oral tradition and also archeology span uh, of occupancy in de Jope area for 12,000 years. So also wanted to echo Dr. Robbins, thanks to the provost office uh, the ed Educational Innovation Program and grant for helping to fund this work. Um, and also a special thanks to Omar Poehler, who has really pioneered, um, or has really, excuse me, spearheaded uh, in cultural education on campus around educating our own people, faculty, staff, leadership, and students about Native people in Wisconsin. Um, I want to just say a couple um, a couple words about uh, Edith Lioso, nicknamed Bardo. Um, Edith is a close colleague of mine. We worked together um, during my graduate work for the Nelson Institute in um, for my community-based research in Bad River. And Edith and I became research partners and also uh, we wrote together for part of my dissertation. We've presented together several times and have become good friends, and I'm very happy to have her here with us today. 
Also want to give a shout out to my students, um, Environmental Studies 600, the capstone students who are working this semester in partnership with Forest County Potawatomi in uh, community-based learning and producing projects for the Potawatomi Nation in their education, uh, land and natural resources and cultural resources departments. My students are working on projects for Potawatomi. So I want to turn it over to uh, the students who will be introducing uh, Edith Leoso. And thank you for joining in today. Enjoy. Take it away, Alex. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear us okay. Today, um, Chloe and I would like to introduce Edith Leozo. Edith is an enrolled member of the Bad River Band of Lakes Superior Chippewa and a member of the Eagle Clan. She serves as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and meets with governments at all levels, both tribal and non-tribal, um, on affairs related to tribal history and culture preservation, um, as well as Native American Grace Protection, Act and the National Historic Preservation Act. Edith also educates the greater public in um, presentations such as this one and through media interviews like ones with NPR. Hi everybody, and Edith is currently working on several projects, one of them being the expansion of the Milepost 7 tailings basin in Silver Bay, Minnesota. Um, she meets with the Army Corps of Engineers to explain the concerns with an extremely large tailings basin like this one and to explain why Lake Superior is a sacred site. Edith also gives tours of the Kakagan Sloughs during the summer months as part of her TIPO work to educate the general public on the tribal cultural relationship with the environment. These tours actually inspired the IMAX film Mysteries of the Great Lakes and the Indigenous Arts and Sciences and Earth Partnership Program at the UW Nelson Institute. Done. Uh, Edith, we'll turn it over to you now. And welcome. Bonjour. Bonjour. So, um, I hope everybody could see me. Um, whenever I give a presentation to anybody, I like to open it in my language because it helps me think about what I want to talk about. Well, for one thing. So with that, I'd like to say we're in a Pujo and we're Magani to Nigani Gabo we quite indigenous class. Guy Nika in the game. He used to be an Onjaba, Guy Nika Pay Medewan, Guy Medewan Equate in Dell. And what I said is that I am uh, called a leading woman or the woman who stands in front of others to ask to lead them. I am um, of the Eagle Clan. I am from Mushki CB, which does not mean bad river. Mushki uh, comes from the word uh, uh, swamp or um, medicine, uh, Mushkiki, and uh, ZB is river. So it's saying medicine river or swamp river. Um, bad river, the name came from the French who couldn't navigate up our river. And so, um, I'm also um, fourth degree Medewin, and I'm also um, a Mede woman who takes care of the lodge, especially the water. Um, so uh, I guess today I, I was thinking of what it was I wanted to talk about here. And uh, one of the things that um, I was doing just before we, I hooked into this was responding to some uh, XL energy work that's going to go on on our reservation. And in uh, a comment I gave to the uh, company was that we needed to do a botanical survey in the area, but it was from a, a tribal perspective to identify medicinal plants and and um, other things that are growing in the uh, right of way that's going to be brushed as well as trees. So, um, so they asked, well, is this still something that we have to do be, given what's going on right now? And my response was, yeah, it's something we should be doing um, uh, 
uh, especially for what's going on right now, because um, some of the plants that are out there are what is what uh, helps us, you know, in, in times like this. So part of my job is identifying whether what is significant to tribal people in uh, federal undertaking. So if somebody's going to go out and disturb an area of land or a, a, uh, or um, build something or permit somebody to build something or disturb an area, we would have to look for what would be significant for tri to tribal people. And one of the significant things that are uh, important to us right today is medicines and the medicines that are out there today because um, it isn't um, whether or not uh, if we get uh, contaminated, it's when. And when that happens, we need to be prepared for that. So it's good to look for the medicines that we need um, uh, um, and be able to help our people in our community. So lately, when I've been sending out emails in that, I say miigwech, which means thank you. And I also say um, Joanna Dig, which in our language means um, take care of one another. And um, before this all happened, I was just saying miigwech. But now, I think it's really important for people to recognize that, that we have only each other's and that we should, um, should take care of one another. I know that that sounds odd in that we're doing these social distancing and things like that. But like one of the things I had to do first thing this morning was to uh, sew a mask for my 70 year old brother who is in a, a high rise and can't get out, only goes out to the um, get his medicine. And, but he likes taking a drive around and things like that. So um, he went to get his medicine and it was the lady at Walgreens who's familiar with all the tribal people who said, well, you know who's throwing masks up? And he said, who? He said, Bardo. And, uh, and my brother said, what, my sister? <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, I was gonna surprise you this weekend, all right? <laughs> but I have to drop that off to him today. So, um, so uh, and, and my brother Butch, he he's, was one of our um, Sancho Gichidas here on our reservation. He has um, um, respiratory problems. Um, and knee problems. Of course, he walked around the whole Lake Superior in the first uh, water walk that was ever done uh, and organized by um, um, Walt Brzezette. And, uh, and on, along that walk is when they met um, Josephine Mondamin. And it was called the Walk to Remember. And it was to raise awareness to of, of the, the water and how sacred the water is to not just uh, Anishinaabe people, but to everybody. How important it is for, for us to um, remember to take care of the water, especially times like this, you know, one of the things that we may need is, is very clean water and access to that water. Uh, so um, he helped uh, organize that and he walked around the entire Lake Superior. And so after this uh, session here, I get to go and visit him for a moment and give him some, a, a mask and some gloves so that he can go out and, and with uh, uh, some sense of security. Um, and um, hopefully he can see everybody that he can um, and maintain his distancing. But that's part of Joanna Dig is that we take care of one another. We, we uh, do the little bit that we can to be able to help. Um, I was uh, telling uh, Paul er earlier that um, here at Bad River, we haven't um, completely closed down. 
Um, sure, our casino is shut down, our grocery store is closed, but we still have access to the groceries inside of it. Our, uh, uh, most of our offices are all working remotely. Um, and I get to come into my office because I'm the only one here and I live alone and uh, nobody else is here. And it's, it's a whole totally separate building. But um, we were um, uh, doing a, a little bit for each other. One of the things that we do is we provide meals for our elderly. And since the elderly can't come to the elderly building and sit down with each other and visit and eat, we, we have what's uh, like a little drive up where our elderly will drive up to the elderly building and we'll come out and we'll give a, um, a meal to them at lunchtime. And um, that's something that the social services staff ha ha is in control of. And they do that mask then with gloves on and the elders drive up and they roll down their passenger window and there can't be anybody in their passenger seat and then the staff drops their meal off right there and um that's just a little bit of joanna dig um to take care of one another and it's something that is probably should be on everybody's priority list uh, today is what is that little bit that i can do to help out the uh, maybe somebody in my neighborhood, maybe somebody, um, you know, uh, nearby that I won't come in physical contact with, but I can do something. And that's part of our culture here at Bad River is uh, doing, doing Joanna Dig, taking care of one another, uh, loving one another, and helping one another. That's what that one word uh, encompasses. Um, so, um, we continue to do that. Um, we uh, we also um, are going to continue with our ceremonies here. And one of the ceremonies that we do is um, we do a water ceremony when the ice goes out. So the uh, water ceremony will be done as we normally do it, but we'll have we'll will maintain the social distancing and the people will be lined up along the river, you know, and giving their offerings in, into the water. And that's something that um, we'll continue to do. Um, we're still trying to figure out how we'll do our other ceremonies, which actually has a uh, contact with one another. Um, but one of the things that uh, we always remember is that the water is very important to us. And um, like the person who introduced me earlier um, talked about, I had to review a project that is at the Army Corps of Engineers is permitting. And that project is the expansion of a mining tailings basin. And that the expansion of that tailings basin entails uh, um, them making another two mile by two mile um, uh, addition to it. Now that's a lot of uh, waste from, from um, washing rock off. So when they wash the rock off in the mining uh, uh, company, they, they wash it off, all of the uh, toxins come out from it. And they put all of those toxins in this basin, which is this man-made lake. And um, they essentially uh, store it there until it's it's not toxic anymore, which with some of the, the, the toxins that is found in there, that is it for maybe 50,000 years or so. So it, it, it's very concerning to me when you have a tailings basin that right now you can see from from um, on Google Earth from space, and it's larger than the town that it sits next to. And they want to make it even bigger. And it's only an, a mile and a half away from Lake Superior on the other side of the peninsula from where I live. 
And so, um, and, and you think about how um, at least uh, four of those, uh, or, or seven of those have failed in the past four years. Uh, and they're essentially huge mountains, man-made mountains that are containing all this water in miles of uh, square miles of, of space. And it, when when it fails, it's usually the one of the mountains give way, and the entire thing spills out onto whatever it's, is in its path. So when um, when we we look at something like that, it's almost you know common sense. You would think, okay, why would you want to build something like that, or even permit somebody to build something like that so close to one of the largest freshwater bodies on, on planet Earth. And um, it, that's pretty much common sense. Um, at the same time, I have to look at all the other cumulative impacts that go on. And this is one of the cumulative impacts, um, uh, a, a pandemic. So if a pandemic happens, um, you know, we need to have access to clean water. If we are consistently jeopardizing our clean water, then what is it that um, we're doing to not only the immediate area, but, you know, showing to the world that is this all right? Is this okay? It, 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 it is a lot of uh, common sense that comes out of uh, native thinking right and we for years we've been talking common sense and and for years we've been i mean it, it it's like every century we we deal with the pandemic right and it started back in 1692 1642 and uh, um what's his name what was that guy's name oh yeah christopher columbus came and he, when he came, uh, he greeted everybody and it was just them breathing on us that killed us off, right? And when he came on to Florida there, it was common among the communities that they send a runner to the next community to let them know that these uh, people are here and that they're, they may be coming to their community. So get ready to greet them because it was common at that time that you opened your arms up to, to visitors, especially those who were completely different from you. And so um, one of the things that was done at that time is that we sent the runner. Well, that runner had already been breathed on and had already sh shooken hands with the people there. And when he went to the next community, he contaminated them. And then they sent a runner to the next community and so on and so on. So in some of the, uh, um, the notes of Christopher Columbus, it talks about how that pandemic there that hit us, then um, he would, his crew would walk into a community and the entire village would be dead. And that was because of uh, contamination. And the most recent one that was done here was in um, 1918, the uh, influenza, uh, avian flu that came, uh, went worldwide, uh, started in the um, um, World War I, and the men got sick, the soldiers were sick, and they sent them home. Unfortunately, they contaminated the, the, all of the homes as well and, uh, worldwide. So uh, it spread that way. And here, uh, one of our elders told me that his grandmother told him that um, she remembers standing there counting the caskets. And there, they were just boxes, then wooden boxes. And they were 10, lined up 10 in a row, stacked four high, and, and that was four deep. So there was 160 boxes that were in one day buried um, uh, people and that had gone on for about uh, a week, a week and a half. 
I think it was. So each day that same amount was being varied. And so um, we, when that all had gone by, some of the work that I do uh, and my colleagues do, they had actually the opportunity to go out in Alaska where uh, some of the, the um, um, victims of that pandemic were buried in, in the uh, permafrost. And they had went in with total hazmat and ex excavated those remains to see if the, the, the disease was still there. And it was. And so that was something also to think about in, in the job I do is that if people want to uh, disturb human remains in the ground, they need to understand that, you know, we don't know what caused the death of those human remains, those humans, you know, and, and, and we, should, we should be respectful to leave them in there their places that they were, they were buried at. Uh, and more than likely, you know, uh, a lot of people have, have been buried with ceremony. And, um, and this isn't through any culture that there is, there is a particular ceremony that's given. And for, to, to bring that person back to our mother, the earth. And in our uh, way of thinking too, is that we um, we always take care of our mother to earth. We were told at the beginning of, of, of time that um, if we take care of everything on the surface of our mother here, there is everything that is there for us to be able to live a good life. And we should never need to worry. But it's up to us to be able to take care of our mother to earth so that we can live a good life. All the medicines are there. All the food is there. All Everything we need for shelter is there. And what else do we need? <laughs> okay, you need an education, all right? <laughs> so <laughs> I better plug that in a little bit. <laughs> okay, so uh, with that, I think I got about 15 minutes left here, Jess. Okay. So what, else, what do I talk about in 15 minutes here? Uh, I think, um, oh, the, the other thing that we're doing here too, and this is, uh, you know, when I, we talk about ceremony, um, one of the ceremonies we have for healing is our jingle dress ceremony. And that had was done this past weekend. Uh, one of uh, the community members had organized a jingle dress a dance to be held, and, and it was socially distanced. So only the the dancers were out there. They were told to maintain at least a, a ten foot buffer from each other, or six foot buffer from each other. And there was two uh, people on hand drums. One of them, our tribal council member. And we did it in our casino parking lot since the casino was closed, there's nobody parked there. And so we had a large enough space and we asked the community to come to stay in their vehicles to watch that, that, that healing go on and that those dancers would send that healing out to them. And so that's something that, uh, you know, in this time we have to think of ways to be able to to, to do things like that in our communities, to maintain our, our culture and, and uh, keep safe and um, be able to uh, help people. And, and that's a little something that somebody thought of doing and it worked out well. Uh, there, I'm not sure how many vehicles were in the parking lot, but there was several of them, of them there. Um, and um, I don't know, uh, uh, I, did, I was unable to make it because I was sewing masks, um, but um, I was watching it on uh, Facebook and it seemed like there was a lot there, but I was sort of worried because as I was sewing masks and I knew it was going on, 
I seen a, a police car going by and I thought, oh, are they breaking the, the law? <laughs> but they were all in their vehicles and there was only 10 dancers that was out there and two of the singers. So, so it was it was within the 50 people limit. And uh, I think it was 20 or something like that that was going on at the time. But we were also doing a, a, a ceremony on tribal lands, which under um, um, the Indian Religious Freedom Act, we're able to do that. Um, anytime, any place, it, 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 it's what we need to do. And um, it's something that we will continue to do for um, throughout this whole thing, but also as we do regularly. Um, it's it's the way we think, you know, um, our people need healing. Um, and we will also um, through social media, send out, you know, how what the medicines are that uh, are important that we 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 shouldn't mow down with our lawnmowers during this time, you know, and um, that we should allow our 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 yards to grow because we will find those medicines, uh, you know, right there in our our yards. They uh, like poor soils, some of them that are for respiratory problems. Um, the common mullen is is one of them. And we see them like these big torches along the, the roadside. Um, so that's medicine. Um, and it's the uh, flowers on them that are the medicine in it. And uh, I think it was uh, Peterson's um, handbook I was looking at of uh, um, medicinal uh, plants, which is a really uh, a uh, good handbook to me. I, I look at that. Uh, I also have, you know, my hookups in Indian country who, who uh, will mail me some, some bear roots if I need it, which is another uh, medicine for respiratory problems. Um, and also um, um, cedar, uh, white cedar, not the uh, juniper. Uh, the juniper berries are actually poisonous. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, the, the the flat cedar is the one that we use as well, and we make tea out of that. And um, there's there's uh, other medicines that are are out there that have been out there for millenniums, and people uh, from all different walks of life in all different countries have used those medicines. And, and um, they're they're still they're still good to use, and I guess um, that's one of the things that I uh, wanted to pass on to people is that um, now it's you know we might want to go out and mow our lawns, but it might be best not to do that. To let what we think is a weed, such as our, our that that pesky um, dandelion which the dandelion root is also good for respiratory problems um, in a tea um, and the chaga and all those things that we can find uh, right in some things in our yard, some things on the trees um, are, are important. And we should start looking at those medicinal books to be able to have our own uh, home remedies that might go along with um, Western medicine as well. So um, I've got about five more minutes, but given the number of people that are on there, I'm wondering if we should give an extra five minutes for a few. And I like to say miigwech for listening to me. Miigwech. Uh, miigwech for sharing. Can uh, Edith, can you hear me okay? I just put my mic back, back on. Okay. Okay, so um, Emily Reynolds, huge thanks to you as well. And uh, Emily had asked me to help facilitate um, some discussion and Q&A. 
So Emily, can you please weigh in as to how you would like folks to do that? Are we using the chat sidebar to type in questions or do you want people to unmute their mic and start talking? Uh, please let me know which route you would like to go, given that we have 66 people. Yeah, I think the easiest way is going to be for everyone to type their questions into the Q&A um, okay. chat box that's on the bottom um, right hand side of your screen. Those questions will go to Jesse and, and all of us um, panelists um, and then Jesse can field those to Edith. So feel free to write your questions in and hit send and and we'll Jesse can start asking those. Okay, uh, so Emily, once folks type in their question into that Q&A feature within the sidebar, would for purposes of recording and clarity, you would like me to read that question and then Edith uh, can answer. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Okay, sounds good. So uh, ES 600 students and others, um, please open up that Q&A feature on your right sidebar within this webinar and, and type in your questions and we'll take it from there. Can't seem to send mine. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Um, yeah, let's see here. I know I'm not able to either. Emily, does this have to be enabled? Um, nope. So panelists won't be able to enter Q and A. They can enter things on the chat box. Um, so Paul, if you have a question, um, maybe you could just ask that directly to Edith. Um, but I think others um, who are on the call should be able to send them. Jesse, are you seeing these questions that are popping up now, or am I the only one seeing them? Yeah, no, um, you've got no. Q&A coming in now. Okay. I've got Q&A coming in now. Um, so question from Mr. Benji Johnson. How did you get involved in Silver Bay? So uh, one of the things that has to happen um, for a federal agency is that they have to uh, be in compliance with section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. My uh, position as a tribal historic preservation officer is to uh, ensure compliance of section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act and on, on this reservation. But if I feel that there's something going on outside of the reservation, that may impact the reservation, then I can be involved in it. And, and what would happen then was that, is that mostly all everywhere within the tri-state area here, Minnesota, um, Wisconsin, and Michigan, to me, uh, uh, everything that they're doing, and, and I'm not kidding, I get hundreds of letters a day and um, I happened along this one, you know, because I was opening uh, up my mail and um, it had, you know, that they wanted to do this, which expansion. Well, whenever there's a tailings basin expansion near Lake Superior, it, it, it has the potential to risk uh, Lake Superior. So I responded to that request for review of the project that they wanted to do. And um, so that's, and as I'm sitting here, my email's popping up and they must know that I'm talking about them, the Army Corps of Engineers, because I could see that they're trying to email me. <laughs> so, so that's the other way I get involved in this. Um, I'm literally sent hundreds of, of letters a day to uh, ask for my review of the project and let me know if they don't hear back from me within 30 days, then um, they can assume that it's okay to go. But at any time, uh, I can uh, weigh in during the consultation process and say I want to be a, a, a interested party on behalf of the tribe. 
and I can consult on behalf of the tribe. Mm -hmm. So that goes for permitting cell towers, permitting for uh, tailing basins expansion, permitting for mining operations, permitting for all kinds of different things. And that's what the rest of the TIPOs uh, in the state also do. Miigwech, mm -hmm. Edith. A uh, question from Dr. Robbins. Is there a single source, uh, I'm guessing you mean resource, for medicinal plants in the region compiled in a single place? And how concerned is your community about protecting the sovereignty over those genetic resources uh, or issues of biopiracy. Oh, I was reading them on the uh, side there. Say that again. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Yeah, let, let, me lay it out. let me lay it out. Let me lay it out. Okay. Is, is all this out. stuff public knowledge? And how concerned are you that somebody might, you know, capitalize on traditional? Indigenous knowledge um, without your permission. Right, right. With we're, regard to medicinal we're plants. Always we're always concerned about that, uh, about, uh, you know, some huge corporation or, or another that is going to go out there, will hear something. Um, I, I mean, we, within the time frame that a Native person in Minnesota gave out the the uh, knowledge of chaga uh, out there. It only took, uh, I think, it was seven months before it was in a package. Yeah, wow, that that is uh, really quick, and that's how things go, right? And for a long time, we have we have um, held on to a lot of our medicines for that particular reason. Because some companies come in and say, well, this seed is ours and you, no one else can use this seed. And if you do, you have to pay us if you use it. Different things like that go on. So we we are very um, concerned about the use of it. We can say this plant and this plant and this plant, but if you don't know how to use it, it may not be effective, right? Um, if, if, if there's a cone flower out there and they're using the root, when they should be using the cone, there's a big difference, right? Um, so, so it's knowing how to use it. And that's when you give your tobacco to somebody and say, can you help me here? This is what's going on. Um, and that's the appropriate way of doing things. And um, sometimes, you know, when we have said something, it has been, and one of one of our teachings is that you should never take all that there is of one thing. Um, you should always leave a little behind so that more will grow later on. Um, you should always and one of the and we took that to heart when we went out it a long time ago and we were fighting with our enemy. We wiped them all out except for one person, and we sent them home with brand new clothes on, a brand new canoe, and filled up with all kinds of goods and told them don't come back again. But it goes the same way with all of the, the uh, things in creation. And all the things in creation, we should never take more than we need. And so um, always leave that little bit for someone else or and for it to grow again. And um, so, We'll give as much as we can give about medicines and things like that, but we we more than likely will never give all of it, and um, in order to preserve it for humanity, right? So that yeah, we get very concerned about it. Thank you. Jesse, I think you're muted. You'll need to start over. Oh. Hi, I'm back. Thank you, Dr. Robbins and, and Miigwech, Edith, for your response. The, uh, the questions coming in on the sidebar, 
are um, from yeah. my students and also um, other attendees. So the uh, I'm going to prioritize the other attendees questions until 2 p.m., uh, which was the, the wrap up for the general audience. And then at two, we'll go over to the student questions because they are going to be spending some additional time with Edith for about another 15 minutes. So, bear with me. Ryan Sheen asks, I now understand how important the traditional remedy is to the people there, but I was wondering if you could briefly explain how the herbs such as dandelion and chaga are processed into traditional medicine. I think, Edith, you, we can skip that because that's kind of more of a technical question. That, I'll leave that up to you, though, how you want to handle that. Uh, yeah. We can skip that. I was I made a list of the plants that you talked about, and I can share um, some resources for people as well. Yeah, so um, our dandelion and, and chaga, so the dandelion has to be harvested before the, it flowers, mm -hmm. I believe. I, I actually have to check on that. And um, the chaga, uh, when it's taken, it's um, grated like on a cheese grater off from the, into little chunks and the dandelion dried and cut up into little chunks and put in a jar, glass jar, and then um, uh, filled with water and put on your windowsill. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. Okay, thanks, Edith. <laughs> and, and you want it to sit at least over for 24 hours and then, and then you use it. And then after that, you can refrigerate it. Thank you. And as an herbalist and a harvester of 30 years, I, I would I would add into that um, relationships to wild plants for food and medicine is um, it's a lifestyle and it's um, it's a skill that's built over time. And so I want to encourage folks who are interested in that to uh, delve into that, but know that um, it, it takes diligence and um, I'd like to encourage you. And again, I'll share, I'll share some resources, but um, here in this format, we're only able obviously to scratch the surface. Right. Um, and then, yeah. There's one thing I wanted to add too, is, you know, when, like when we harvest the plants and things like that, we usually go out and talk to them, you know, and we put something down for them. We give them an offering and ask them for their help, right? Uh, because we recognize that they have a spirit. There's a spirit with the, those each one of those plants, and 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 we we acknowledge that spirit, and and we ask the spirit kindly for for help. And um, in, in that way, we believe that you know that there's an intangible part to science that never gets done, and we we continue to do that. Um, we, we continue to, to acknowledge the, the spirit of those plants and, and everything they were placed here for, you know, and then for our well being. If we know how to use them. You see this cool deer grazing out there, you know. You need to go look at what that deer was eating because, more than likely, right now, all those animals who are coming out of the the, uh, uh, their sleep time, they're, they're going after the medicines that are, are helping them um, gain a stronger immune system and everything. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're eating those. And that's how a long time ago we recognized that those were important to humankind mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah. Edith, well said, thank you. Uh, Mary, Mar Mario Alves Zaccarelli says, hello, I'm a grad student at Nelson and my research will look at the cultural and environmental impacts of oil pipelines on 
wild rice lakes. In Wisconsin, I will be working on line five. How have you as Bad Rivers Tippo, how are you dealing with the issue? Question mark, miigwech. Well, <laughs> it's a big one. We're in litigation and I can't say anything about it. <laughs> okay. But um, we are, you know, yeah. So I could talk about like, you know, how the water is important to us and how things like a pipeline uh, that ha is at, you know, risk of failure uh, and spilling into a waterway like was done on the Kalamazoo in Michigan uh, mm -hmm. can impact our lives on this reservation. And it would be, you know, detrimental that we don't have a pipeline here. So, um, there's all kinds of things happening with that behind the scenes. I mean, on a daily, and I mean daily, uh, Saturdays and Sundays as well. Uh, we're not, we're, we're busy working on it. Um, there's a lot of things, underhanded things that are happening and we're not really happy with, you know, what we're, you know, some of, it, some of it is, look at, uh, is almost like somebody poking you with the stick saying, come on, do something, come on, do something. And we're sitting there getting poked, right? Uh, because we don't need to uh, compromise our position in this court case, which is going well for us. So, um, um, that's about as much as I could say about it right now, but, you know, they still have the, um, even though we have told them to get off from out of Bad River and shut down the, the flow um, and out of the watershed as well, we didn't just say Bad River, we said the watershed, which is far further uh, out. Um, actually, it's right here. <laughs> behind me <laughs> so um and if you can see right there um that has uh that's that's what's important to us um and keeping that that safe i'm not sure if i answered your question there but uh, i don't think i really can <laughs> Okay. Jesse, you're on mute again. Miigwech, <laughs> Edith. Uh, there's, um, there's a question about relation, Bad River relationships to Excel Energy and then asking about renewable energy and sustainable energy efforts on the res. Are you able to... Uh, share anything with our audience about that yes we just got a half million dollar grant and we are installing um solar panels on for three of our main uh buildings here uh, and they're sort of like our test case of how we can use solar energy but we're also we also use wind energy at the fish hatchery and solar okay. energy and it worked really well we end up paying back you know, we get paid back from the grid on that one because the, our excess energy goes into the grid and it's helping to to power other places. Um, but uh, we're looking at that as well. XL Energy needed to upgrade their line here. Mm -hmm. And instead of going through with um, uh, conversation with the tribe and consultation with us, they decided to reroute it around us as though we're not going to have any of it. But there is funding that's out there for specifically for tribes to be able to uh, do our own energy on the reservation. So we're looking into that. We may tap into the XL off reservation, but we, we said, you know, you could still come through the reservation. We just need to 
get our long-term plan into place of how we want to convert this energy into uh, you know, solar energy and wind energy and using the existing grid to be able to do that. So um, that's one of the things that's going on here. Be good, Edith. Uh, next question, and, and this will probably be one of the last ones for the general audience, unless you want to stay on, which you're surely welcome to do so. Uh, question for you, Edith. Are there educational initiatives for teaching tribal youth on the reservation about medicinal and edible plants? Yes. We have the Indigenous Arts and Sciences program. Um, right now, we may we're we are actually uh, doing some Facebook stuff because it's in the start of this social distancing thing. And um, our wildlife specialist here, a biologist, she is getting it together, Abby uh, Fergus, and she is. Um, teaching them, I forget what it was she was showing them over Facebook. But it's something that, like what we're doing right now, we may be doing with the students, you know, and have them go outside and get this, find this piece and bring it back and things like that. But we'll talk to them via social media and that, um, and, and, and these types of platforms to uh, be able to get our, our um, information across to them now at this time. Um, and, you know, we can still use snail mail and mail things to them um, at their, to their homes where they'll receive it. Uh, like pictures of different um, uh, plants and things like that. But um, we'll, we'll talk with them, you know, we'll figure it out here. We have large open spaces where we live here where we can get together with kids with kids um you know and and be able to maintain our distance from each other uh, but we also have these um these platforms here to be able to show them this is what this looks like you know and and you can find it in this place and this is how you brew it up and um do things with that we have, a, a, I think he's 13 year old, who's really into it right now uh, on our reservation. He spends most of his summer going out and harvesting different things and drying them and telling me what they are, you know? <laughs> but he's, he's my nephew. <laughs> so I just encourage him, just keep on going, keep on going. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's excellent. Good to hear. So, uh, 2 p.m. was our was our designated uh, stop time. Um, although, given given the format, um, I'd like to say to folks, uh, you're you're welcome to listen in for the rest of the student questions, if you choose to. Um, but at this time, for folks who need to sign off at two, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for joining us and um let's give edith a round of applause so um i'm gonna go into the rest of the student questions lady and then um give them some a little extra time to interact with you edith okay. uh, so ms justine Oh, Jesse, do you want me to turn off the recording at this point? Or do you want to let it keep going? I think leave it on. I think it'll okay, be great. good to have. Okay, thanks, Emily. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Justine Spore asks, uh, Edith, what is your next project that you would like to tackle um, or an area that you would like to see progress uh, related to preservation? Well, I think it will have to be given the time frame right now and the priority. It's going to have to be the preservation of our, our our medicinal plants and the use of them. Like I said before, you know, it's um, it's one thing to know what the you know this plant's good for this and this plant's good for that. But do you know how to brew it up? You know how to make it into a poultice? You know how to use it? 
And that's one of the most important things is that we, it, we can say this and that about plants, but if we don't know how they work or how to greet them or how to harvest them, you know, in a good way, in, in a kind way, uh, then we forget about, you know, that part of our culture and to, to actually preserve that is probably um, the next thing we're going to do as soon as they start springing up out there. Let me go to you to this outdoors. I'll do things like this outdoors. Right. Me too. Yeah. Uh, another question from Hope Oberg. Are jingle dresses handmade by tribal members in the community? And if so, how long would it typically take to make them? Okay. Well, that depends on the sewer and how 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 much uh experience that person has in, in sewing. And I say that person because uh, men have also made jingle dresses in that. Um, so um, for their daughters in that, because uh, we have fathers who uh, uh, take care of their kids. And so um, I, I, it used to take me about four days to make a dress from scratch. And that's before they made the cones. And then after the cones were done, it took me about a uh, day and a half. It took me one day to cut everything out and then another day to make it, throw it all together. Yep. Miigwech, Edith, and thank you for your question. Okay, here we go. Uh, from Bryce Linden. way UW reaches out to the Madison community is through citizen science uh, in which regular people can make and record data observations and be a part of bigger scientific projects. The Bad River Reservation also utilize similar initiatives uh, for all ages and not just youth in terms of like uh, water monitoring or insect monitoring or other wildlife monitoring, uh, Edith. Okay, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question here. You know, you reached out to the Madison community through citizen science. Oh, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and regular people can make data observations and be a part of it uh utilize yeah so that would be like if if bad river natural resource departments do they do trainings for tribal public in terms of gathering data about wildlife or plants or water actually um we we're working towards that um right just recently we like a two weeks ago we hired a manuman specialist and that is Charles Wiggins, who works with us now. And um, one of the th uh, strategies to uh, take care of our wild rice beds was to be able to train people on um, harvesting other edible plants that are out in the sloughs, but are crouched and crouching on the rice plant. And so by removing those, those other edibles, uh, like we did in the past, um, this uh, this would enable our rice to grow better, but at the same time, we would be teaching our tribal members, you know, this is the time that you come out into the rice beds, and this is the time that you want to stay stay away from the rice beds, and this is the reason why. You know, things like that um, we do, but at the same time, they're they're actually helping to make a healthier rice bed uh, by going out there and harvesting those plants. And making use of them. Wonderful. Thank you, Bryce and Miigwech, Edith. Um, ES 600 students, any other questions for, actually, hang on, I saw one from Michael. Let me go back up to that. 
Uh, got time for a few more questions. So, uh, hey, students out there, I want to see you weighing in. Um, so, Edith, a question from Michael Vigdor, also in my class. Um, do you think it would be helpful for information pertaining to home remedies and or development projects affecting the community to be posted online or do you see negative impacts of this? So asking about uh, public information about medicinal plants. Um. You know, there's a certain way that I've been taught to gather medicinal plants in that. And I, and what we say is when, once you've been taught in this particular way, that's the way you have to teach others. And um, so that's, that wasn't through online um, things. Uh, mm -hmm. Although given the circumstances today, we may be doing something like that, but making it out to the general public Probably not. Um, what we would probably uh, do is um, try and get some kind of platform together to be able to maintain how we do it traditionally. Mm -hmm. And knowing that, you know, this isn't going to be forever, uh, what we're going through right now. Um, so we'll need to uh, do something. And as soon as I figure that out, <laughs> it's a good question though, you know, <laughs> gonna get that out there. It is a good question. Uh, and there's also, there's also uh, I believe other materials out there on the use of uh, medicinal plants too. You know, because some of the plants that we have here are not originally from here. They're non-traditional plants, which people are now calling invasive plants or exotic plants, but they're non-traditional and they came from Europe. And in Europe, you know, it's good to go to where the source is and ask them, how is this used? Which way do you use this? You know, if it's from Sweden, if it's from Russia, if it's from, um, uh, China, you know, <laughs> it, mm -hmm. we can still find those medicinal uh, uh, the uses there in those places in India, wherever. And because we have this thing called the internet, we're able to do that now. Mm -hmm. You know, we're able to put those questions out there, and hopefully, it finds somebody. And hopefully, we question the right person. You know, right? Yeah or they can find somebody to help us. Okay. Uh, question from Emily Snelson. In what ways do you incorporate spatial technologies um, such as GIS, cartography, other maps into your work as a typo? Oh, all kinds of ways. Okay. Yeah, I have a map of, you know, we're always creating maps here, you know, birch bark harvesting maps, wild rice maps. Um, I mean, we, uh, Susie Smith, who's our GIS person here, we work together a lot and she's always coming up to me and saying, hey, this is what I got today, you know, of uh, these different uh, technology that comes through. We also, one of the things that I use, um, is a uh, lidar uh, and it shows you know within right down to the actual uh earth itself right so so it, it shows the image of the earth itself but it also can show me um you know these old trails on the earth that are just a little bit raised but you you would never see it you know if you looked at that a, a, a smooth lawn, you never see the old trail that went through that lawn or or, uh, or through this wooded area. 
because LIDAR takes all that those things away and shows you the, the earth itself. So we can see there, you know, if a mound is in place, we can see if uh, an old trail is there, an old logging road. Uh, and, and we have to determine whether it was an old logging road or whether it was an old bootlegger's road, <laughs> which we have both of those here. <laughs> Um, yeah. so, but, but there's, sorry, there's all kinds of uh, um, mapping that we do. You know, we have all our burial sites mapped out. We have uh, different areas that we consider highly significant mapped out. But we have all our waterways mapped out, and we have, um, I think, just about everything mapped right now. And um, it's it's who has access to those layers. That's the thing. No, we don't put those out online um, because uh, there's a certain places that we want to be able to uh, keep from people who are called pot hunters. Uh, those pot hunters end up uh, going into places like the mounds in Madison um, on, a, on a, every season every summer they're being ravaged by people who are, are specifically doing it to take out of those mounds and um, mm -hmm. sell what they find on the black, black market which there is a black market in Madison mm -hmm. unfortunately and so um, yeah we we don't put a lot out on on online okay Miigwech, Edith. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that we wrap it up. So, students that are on, uh, I I see you on here in the sidebar. I've got um. I want to take a chance to uh, say chi miigwech to Edith. So please give her a round of applause. Miigwech. Hopefully, I can see you someday and give you a tour over to the sluice there. Oh, we might be cutting that off too. We're we're just going from the lakeside onto the big sluice mm. to prevent the um, uh, wake from happening in on the um, rice beds on the river. Okay. Yeah. Um, Edith, we're gonna do that. Okay. Uh, Miigwech, lady, and um, for asking me. Yeah, and we'll we'll be in touch with follow ups, um, and I'll share some plant resources. Uh, students, ES six hundred students, um, please stay on. I have a couple things that I want to talk to you about. Um, Edith, if you you can stay on too if you want to chat with me. This will just take two minutes, um, or you can sign off. It's up to you. Hi, Emily. I oh sorry, I can sign off. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Give me a call. Okay. <laughs> I will. See ya. Gigo Abamen. Gigo Abamen. Emily, do you want to stop the recording and then I'll just finish out with my students? Is that okay? Yep, I can do that. Okay, great. Lady, thanks a lot.